8. Credit. We are obliged to make a supposition by no means flattering to the individual presented to the reader. Let us suppose, therefore, that some miserable mortal, who is utterly devoid of any personal good quality to recommend him, makes his advent on the stage of action, and demands credit. Are there circumstances under which he can obtain it? Most certainly. Though he possesses neither energy, morality nor business capacity, yet if he owns a farm worth $2,000, which he is willing to mortgage as security for $1,500 that he desires to borrow, he will be considered as eminently deserving of credit. He is neither industrious, punctual, capable, nor virtuous. But he owns a farm clear of debt worth $2,000 and verily he shall raise the $1,500. Personal credit is one thing. Real credit is another and a very different thing. In one case, it is the man who receives credit. In the other, it is the property, the thing. Personal credit is in the nature of partnership. Real credit is in the nature of a sale, with a reserved right of repurchase under conditions. By personal credit, two men or more are brought into voluntary mutual relations. By real credit, a certain amount of fixed property is transformed, under certain conditions and for a certain time, into circulating medium. That is, a certain amount of engaged capital is temporarily transformed into disengaged capital. A young man goes to a capitalist saying, if you will lend me $100, I will go into a certain business, and make $1,500 in the course of the present year. And my profits will thus enable me to pay you back the money you lend me, and another $100 for the use of it. Indeed it is nothing more than fair that I should pay you as much as I offer. For, after all, there is a great risk in the business, and you do me a greater favor than I do. The capitalist answers, I cannot lend you money on such terms. For the transaction would be illegal. Nevertheless, I am willing to help you all I can, if I can devise a way. What do you say to my buying such rooms and machinery as you require, and letting them to you on the terms you propose? 4. Though I cannot charge more than 6% on money loaned, I can let buildings, whose total value is only $100, at a rate of $100 per annum, and violate no law. Or, again, as I shall be obliged to furnish you with the raw material consumed in your business. What do you say to our entering into a partnership, so arranging the terms of agreement that the profits will be divided in fact, as they would be in the case that I loan you $100 at 100% interest per annum? The young man will probably permit the capitalist to arrange the transaction in any form he pleases, provided the money is actually forthcoming. If the usury laws speak any intelligible language to the capitalist, it is this, the legislature does not intend that you shall lend money to any young man to help in his business, where the insurance upon the money you trust in his hands, and which is subjected to the risk of his transactions, amounts to more than 6% per annum on the amount loaned. And, in this speech, the deep wisdom of the legislature is manifested. Why 6, rather than 5 or 7? Why any restriction at all? Now for the other side for we have thus far spoken of the usury laws as they bear on mere personal credit l if a man borrows $1,500 on the mortgage of a farm, worth, in the estimation of the creditor himself, $2,000, why should he pay 6% interest on the money borrowed? What does this interest cover? Insurance? Not at all. For the money is perfectly safe, as the security given is confessedly ample. The insurance is zero. Does the interest cover the damage which the creditor suffers by being kept but of his money for the time specified in the contract? This cannot be the fact, for the damage is also zero, 
since a man who lends out money at interest, on perfect security, counts the total amount of interest as clear gain, and would much prefer letting the money at one half percent to permitting it to remain idle. The rate of interest upon money lent on perfect security is commensurate, not with the risk the creditor runs of losing his money, for that risk is zero not to the inconvenience to which the creditor is put by letting the money go but of his hands, for that inconvenience is also 014, since the creditor lends only such money as he himself does not wish to use. But it is commensurate with the distress of the borrower. 1% per annum interest on money lent on perfect security is, therefore, too high a rate. And all levying of interest money on perfect security is profoundly immoral 15, since such interest money is the fruit of the speculation of one man upon the misfortune of another. Yet the legislature permits one citizen to speculate upon the misfortune of another to the amount of six hundredths per annum of the extent to which he gets him into his power. This is the morality of the usury laws in their bearing on real credit.